intention of taking oath as a Chief Justice of India had a message across that he is a man on mission who aims at bringing out the knowledge lamp to ignite the fire in every judicial officer to become the best version of us. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by the highly motivated, dedicated, the Honorable Chief Justice of Andhra Pradesh, Sri Prashant Kumar Mishraji, Honorable President and members of the Board of Governors of the Academy, Honorable Chairman and members of IT Committee and Honorable Judges of High Court. Today's program has seen the light of this day due to their constant persuasion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our Honorable Sri Justice A.V. Sesh Sai Garu, who is known for his simplicity and knowledge, to please come on to the dais. I request Srimati Sneeta Garu, Resident of Residence, to welcome His Lordship with floral honours. Now let me have the pleasure of inviting His Lordship Honourable Sri Justice C. Praveen Kumar Garu, who is known for his uprightness, on to the dais to invite the dignitaries on to the dais and say a few words about His Lordship Honourable the Chief Justice of India. I request Honourable Director of AP Judicial Academy, Sri Harihar Nada Sharma Garu, to present a floral bouquet to His Lordship. Respected invitees and guests of this circus gathering, good morning to you all. It gives me immense pleasure to speak to you all this morning to welcome you cordially to the inaugural function of the Andhra Pradesh Judicial Academy High Court Digitization Program, Neutral Citation and E-Court, E-Certified Copy Application. It is my proud privilege to proclaim that today is an epoch-making day in the annals of Andhra Pradesh Judiciary for the long-cherished and coveted Judicial Academy for the State of Andhra Pradesh has just been inaugurated by the Honorable Chief Justice of India, Sri Justice Dhananjay Vai Chandrasud Garu. I also deem it privilege as President of Board of Governors to welcome the dignitaries on this historic occasion. The wheels of justice started rolling a couple of days ago. It requires planning and a bird's eye view for details. We are fortunate enough to be backed by a team headed by our motivated Honorable Chief Justice of Andhra Pradesh. His efforts and nature made it possible for this day in shortest time. May I request Honorable Chief Justice of Andhra Pradesh High Court, Sri Justice Prakshant Kaur Mishra Garu, on to the dais. May I request Honorable Register General Sri Vai Lakshman Rao Garu to present floral bouquet to His Lordship. We deem it a divine ordainment and a benevolent blessing from God Almighty that our judicial academy is inaugurated today through the golden hands of an academician of the stature of his lordship, who is a versatile visiting professor of various universities across the world, a social philosopher and a firm follower of Roscoe Pond's doctrine of law and instrument of social change, social engineering, and also a jurist and jurisprudential exponent on a spectrum of vibrant subjects of social importance. I take the pleasure in inviting Dr. Justice D.Y. Chandrachud Garu, the Honorable Chief Justice of India, onto the dais. Honorable the Chief Justice of India will be escorted to the dais by the Honorable Register Administration, Sri Alipati Girdar Garu, and I request His Lordship Honorable the Chief Justice of AP, Mr. Justice Prashant Kumar Mishraji, to welcome His Lordship with floral honors. The Honorable Chief Justice of India, as you all know, is a visionary and an intellectual in his own right. He is upright in posture and structure, upholder of the basic structure, a hulk in all great qualities, always engaged in clearing the cases. Sir, to praise you is to attempt carrying goals to Newcastle, but permit me to quote few of your statements. Quote, 
Our ability to recognize others who are different is a sign of our own evolution. We miss the symbols of compassionate and human society only at our peril. This quote from Honorable Chief Justice of India's words of wisdom demonstrates how profoundly he feels for the principles of equality and justice, not just in words, but in acts. A man for the space age, bringing in the assistance of artificial intelligence to aid and assist the human intelligence for a quick diagnosis of the case so as to achieve an accelerate dispensation of justice. Humility embodies when his lordship stated that as Chief Justice of India, he will have to fill big shoes of his great predecessors in office. His lordship is dynamic to tell the need to break the reticence in the judicial system and start realizing the virtues of modern means of communication. Putting his words into action that I am not here to do miracles but to work on bringing institutional changes as a first step to change the face of the Sikh judiciary, he brought a revolutionary change in addressing the cornerstone of the judicial system as we have been habituated the using the age-old hackneyed expression subordinate while referring to the trial courts which is now replaced with district judiciary. My Lord is a symbol of change and a firm believer that change is a rule of nature. His Lordship's aim at institutionalizing the mechanism for improving judicial infrastructure would be the best gift in the 75th year of independence. Finally, our Chief Justice of India's words to someone who refuses to become a judge that if you don't accept judgeship today, you will get the judges you deserve in the future is a warning bell to all. It's time that every member of the judiciary understands this fact. It's a time to act. I, on behalf of Board of Governors of Andhra Pradesh Judicial Academy, once again extend you, sir, a warm welcome and express our profound gratitude for your gracious presence and inaugurating the Andhra Pradesh Judicial Academy. Sir, your presence today has brought a glory to the event. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Justice. It's our tradition to light a lamp before starting any event or function, as light is a form and symbol of Tej. The lamp is invoked as Tamaso Maji Uttirgamai, which means the lamp leads us from darkness to light. So, ladies and gentlemen, following our tradition, let's illuminate the gathering with lightning of flame. I request the Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Sri Chandrachud Garu, and all the dignitaries on the dais to kindly proceed to kindle the lamp. Thank you, my lords and dignitaries. Now it's time for the introductory address by the Honorable, the Chief Justice of Andhra Pradesh, Sri Prashant Kumar Mishraji. Ladies and gentlemen, now may I request the dynamic and versatile son of the land of the hidden treasure and biodiversity, Chhattisgarh, who is known for his impeccable blind of wit and vigor. Honorable, Sri Prashant Kumar Mishraji, for his lordship at grace. Honorable Dr. Justice Jananjay Vaya Chandrachur, the Chief Justice of India, Brother Justice C. Praveen Kumar, President Board of Governors of AP Judicial Academy, Justice A.V. Sesasai, Senior Judge and one of the Governor of AP Judicial Academy, my esteemed brother and sister judges, Lord Advocate General, President AP High Court Bar Association and President of other district bar associations, Chairman and members of the Bar Council of AP, learned senior advocates, other advocates present over here, 
the trainee judicial officers, students from different law colleges, members of print and electronic media, officers of the district administration, ladies and gentlemen, a warm good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. It is my proud privilege to welcome Honorable Dr. Justice Dhananjay Vai Chandrachur, the Chief Justice of India, and everyone present here to this event. Justice Chandrachur is a legend, is a legal luminary, and I always say he is a gift of God to the Indian judiciary. This day will go down in the history of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh as a momentous occasion, for we have amongst us Honorable the Chief Justice of India to inaugurate the AP Judicial Academy, High Court Digitization Program, Neutral Citation, and E-Certified Copy Application. Dr. Chandrachur, the Chief Justice of India, needs no introduction to the gathering. To speak about his lordship is like throwing light to the sun. However, it is always an honor to speak about him. From being a topper of St. Stephen's College, Delhi in 1979, with honors in economics and mathematics, from being awarded prestigious INLAX scholarship in LLM from Harvard Law School, from being the recipient of Joseph L. Beale Prize for securing the highest marks in conflict of law course and completing his doctorate in Jurid juridical sciences in 1986 from Harvard Law School. His lordship was and is an extraordinary student. He was designated as senior advocate by Bombay High Court in June 1998 at a young age of 38 years and then served as Additional Solicitor General of India in Supreme Court. As a judge of Bombay High Court and Chief, and Chief Justice of Allahabad High Court, his lordship had shown tremendous juris, judicial and administrative skills, rendering contribution on judicial and administrative side as well. His lordship has keen interest in academics. His lordship taught comparative constitutional law at the University of Mumbai and University of Oklahoma, USA. He gave lectures at the Australian National University, Howard Law School, Yale Law School, and different other law schools. Landmark judgments penned down by his lordship are showing path to the judiciary. His lordship's pioneering judgments are so lucid and convincing that constitutional nectar oozes out of the principles laid down in those judgments. Be it on right to privacy in justice case, Puttaswamy's case, decriminalizing Section 377 of the IPC in Nautej Johar's case, adults' right to decide on marriage or change of religion in Hardia marriage case, rights of menstruating women in entering Sabri Mala temple, the importance of right to bail in Arnab Goswami's case, sexual autonomy of women in Jesuit Science case, his lordship has been on a constant endeavor to ensure that constitution is an organic document and evolution of law is a continuous process. According to his lordship, morality is a fluid concept which varies from person to person and that hundreds of young people die in the country due to honor killings merely because they love someone or marry outside their caste or against their family wishes. His lordship has a penchant for upholding constitutional values and he feels that the values of a progressive constitution serve as a guiding force for us. They convey that our personal and professional lives aren't divorced from the Constitution. Sir, after the establishment of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh in January 2019, for the last about four years, newly appointed or promoted judicial officers have not undergone institutional and academic training which was not perceived well by the stakeholders. After great effort and persuasion and with the assistance of the state government, a GO was issued on 20th October 9, 2022 for establishment of AP Judicial Academy 
which is now inaugurated today by Honorable the Chief Justice of India. This academy will serve the judiciary till eternity and with it the name of Dr. Ch Justice Dharanja Vai Chandrachur will remain engraved in the history of AP judiciary. We the AP judiciary shall remain obliged forever to his lordship for accepting our invitation to grace the occasion of inaugurating the Judicial Academy. After creation of the new High Court and the state of, for the state of Andhra Pradesh, 79 junior civil judges were appointed up to 2021. Recently, 21 junior civil judges have been selected and they are awaiting appointment. During the last one year, 21 senior civil judges have been promoted as district judges and 27 junior civil judges have been promoted as senior civil judges. They are all participating here today in this inaugural program and will receive orientation training after this inaugural session. As a matter of fact, the entire state judiciary is watching this program and they are keen to listen to his lordship as in the every district court and other courts, the judicial officers have assembled in the court premises right now to hear my Lord Honorable the Chief Justice of India. Since beginning, High Court of AP was having dearth of staff. As against sanctioned strength of 990 employees of the High Court, only 316 employees were allocated during bifurcation in January 2019. Same is the situation with the staff of the district judiciary, where recruitment had not taken place since 2015. Recently, the High Court has notified recruitment to 241 posts in the High Court, and in a centralized recruitment process, the High Court has notified 3,410 posts to be filled up in different judicial districts. Once this recruitment process is complete by mid-February 23, Difficulties in administration in the High Court and District Judiciary owing to the of staff would be finally over. High Court of AP is an infant High Court. We are striving hard and leaving no stone unturned to build the institution. During COVID pandemic, 3,27,000 virtual hearings have taken place. Digitization of court record is one of the most important tasks for the Indian Judiciary. Once court records are digitized, it will provide necessary infrastructure for conducting paperless courts and virtual hearing. It will also help in applying artificial intelligence in administration of justice. In the recently held Constitution Day event and Chief Justice's conference, my Lord the Chief Justice of India laid great emphasis on digitization and importance of information technology in administration of justice. Computer Committee of the High Court and Subordinate Courts, constituted under e-courts projects, toiled day in and day out to ensure that digitization of court records should commence at the earliest. Online certified copy application will enable the lawyers and litigants to obtain certified copies without applying for the same physically by coming to the High Court. Likewise, neutral citation is also a great step towards providing a platform for all the judgments of the High Court being made available through a mode of citation. We are thankful to the Orissa High Court and the High Court of Kerala for providing necessary assistance in planning digitization and neutral citation. And this happened on the call made by Honorable the Chief Justice of India during the Law Day conference that every High Court should share the best practices which they have developed. We are confident that under the leadership of Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Indian judiciary will leave an indelible footprint in the global judicial arena. And the High Court of AP shall not leave any stone unturned in achieving the goals set forth by His Lordship. On this occasion, let us all pledge that we would ensure that His Lordship's motto that justice should be delivered in an unpolluted and unhindered way to the poor and marginalized section of the society is fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Justice, for the warmth which you presented the introductory address. May I request Honorable Sri Justice R. Raghunandan Garu, Chairman, IT Committee, who is an outstanding personality and a work colleague, 
on to the dais for presentation about the High Court Digitization Program, laying foundation of Digitization Center, inauguration of e-certified copy, neutral citation, which is to be inaugurated by the Honorable the Chief Justice of India. May I, on behalf of the IT Committee, request a few moments of your time to view a short video on the initiatives that are being inaugurated today. The AP Judicial Academy is an institution devoted for promotion of continuous legal education, research and capacity building of judicial officers and other stakeholders in the justice delivery system progressing under the supervision of the Honorable High Court of Andhra Pradesh. The Honorable Chief Justice of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh is the Patron-in-Chief of the Judicial Academy. The Judicial Academy is located at Mangalgiri of Guntur District. The building consists of six floors. There are a total of 33 rooms which can house computer lab, classroom, chambers for the in-house and visiting faculty, and library. In 22 hostel rooms, the trainee judicial officers can be accommodated. Welcome to the High Court Digitization Center. The High Court of Andhra Pradesh has started the digitization of disposed and pending records in HCDC. The case bundle is first entered in an e-register and processed for metadata entry, barcoding, and scanning by unstitching and preparing it for scanning. After scanning, bookmarking and quality checking, the record is forwarded to electronic signature. After further random checking, electronic signature is appended to ensure that there shall not be any tampering. The High Court of Andhra Pradesh has developed e-certified copy application to furnish certified copies of its orders through electronic process to all the stakeholders. The registered stakeholder enters his or her registered mobile number and also OTP. The order for which e-copy application is being filed by the stakeholder, the application calculates the fees to be paid. Upon payment of requisite fee, the order copy is made ready and intimated to the stakeholder. The stakeholder can download the order copy certified with an electronic signature. The High Court of Andhra Pradesh implemented the process of assigning neutral citation numbers to all the cases uploaded into the database of the High Court. The moment the judgment in a case is uploaded, the application automatically assigns a citation. The citation is in the form of year, APHC, citation number, such as 2022, APHC, 230. There are four search options to retrieve these citations by citation, year search, case number and order date. The neutral citation system can be used for citing judgments in all the courts. May I now request the Honorable the Chief Justice of India to inaugurate, uh, to unveil the foundation stone of the High Court Digitization Center. May I now, uh, thank you sir, may I now request the Honourable the Chief Justice of India to inaugurate the digitization program of the High Court. Thank you sir.
may now request the Honorable the Chief Justice of India to inaugurate the ECD app of the High Court. Thank you, sir. May I now request the Honorable the Chief Justice of India to inaugurate the Neutral Citation Initiative. Thank you, sir. May I now request the Honorable the Chief Justice of India to release the first annual report of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh. Thank you, my Lord Justice. Before proceeding further, may I request once again all the participant officers, ladies and gentlemen, to kindly switch off your mobile phones or to put it in silent mode or aeroplane mode. The most writing moment has come through for listening to His Lordship address. With all humbleness, may I request my Lord Justice, Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Dr. Justice Sri D. Y. Chandrachud Garu, who is upright, selfless, recognizes right to privacy and dignity as an intrinsic part of right to life and they are to be in the highest pedestal to kindly address the gathering. Honorable dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, now the address. The Honorable Chief Justice of the High Court of Andhra Pradesh, Justice Prashant Kumar Mishra, Justice C. Praveen Kumar, President of the Board of Governors of the Judicial Academy, Justice A. V. Shehasai, all the brother and sister judges of the High Court, Advocate General, members of the Bar Council, trainee judges, senior advocates, senior officials of the government, and dignitaries. I am truly delighted to be here to inaugurate the Andhra Pradesh Judicial Academy. I am really happy to have this opportunity to visit this beautiful state and to unveil all the new initiatives which have been adopted by the High Court. Besides the new Judicial Academy building, you have the numerous e-court related activities, as well as, of course, the release of the uh, annual report of the High Court. So all these initiatives which we see this morning and which we have unveiled this morning represent a combination of the need to create the infrastructure for a newly created High Court for a comparatively new state combined with the benefits of technology which we seek to bring to these initiatives. As I said, this is really a High Court with a very entrenched and rich history. It's a new High Court but it's a High Court with a very deep sense of tradition and history. But when a new institution is set up, we have to ensure that you create new traditions, new practices, following upon the footprints of what we have inherited in order to maintain the stability and the fabric of the judicial institution. Setting up new buildings is a fairly easy task. Even there you have to ensure that the government gives you enough funds and infrastructural support. But having set up the infrastructure, the more difficult task which lies ahead 
is to ensure that the infrastructure is sustainable. Sustainable not merely in financial or administrative terms, but sustainable in terms of the practices which we enunciate, our interpersonal relations, how we groom those who will pass through the portals of our courts for the future of the judiciary and the nation. For our trainee officers, let me begin my brief address this morning by telling you that our attire in the legal profession, whether you are a lawyer or a judge, is marked by the combination of black and white. We wear white shirts, we wear black coats. In fact, the joke in Maharashtra when I was a young lawyer was, how do you recognize a judicial officer? You will normally recognize a judicial officer, the joke was, by finding someone wearing a white trouser, a black coat, perhaps a black tie, and driving his bicycle to work. Times have changed. They have changed because the his now has been substituted by their, both men and women, who are coming in large numbers to the judicial fraternity. In many states, and I was delighted to learn that Andhra Pradesh is no exception, the number of young recruits involve almost an equal number of women as men. And when I say almost, it is not that the women are short of the numbers of men entering into the judicial uh, profession. They have outstripped, in terms of numbers, the number of men coming into the judicial fraternity, the judicial service. And I do believe that this is the sign of the times when judicial services will be enriched by the presence of what constitutes a very rich and more than half our society today. So I do believe that the future in our profession belongs to the women. Now coming back to the black and white that our judicial officers wear, the black and the white represents a contrast. It represents a contrast between truth and falsehood. It represents a contrast between what is just and what is unjust. But so very often, what happens in our courts and what you will learn during the course of your career is that the opposing viewpoints in a court are not opposing viewpoints between truth and untruth. Very often the opposing viewpoints in our courts are between what is true and what is more true or what is true and which is not entirely true. Or the battle in a court is not between justice and injustice always. Of course there are battles between what is just and what is unjust. But very often the battle is between two rights, two opposing sides, each of whom is right in their own way. So when you have to decide cases, you have to also decide when there is a conflict of the right and the right. And sometimes there is a conflict between the wrong and the wrong. And then you decide where in this kind of a conflict does the balance of justice lie. The black and white which we wear to court and as judges of the higher courts we wear our gowns which are black. The black and white which we wear has another symbolic significance which is something much more than merely being symbolic. And that symbolism which you must understand at the threshold of your careers is that our profession is a profession of inclusion. We all come into the profession from different genders. We all come into the profession from different regions. We come into the profession from different religions that we may follow. And I dare say that we also belong to different segments of the community. 
We belong to different segments of the community, whether it be in terms of caste, whether it be in terms of region, or whether it be in terms of religion. But there is something unique about the legal profession. And when I refer to the legal profession, I don't merely refer to the bar, but also to those who are judges. And what is unique to our profession is that we are all one. We are united in a common pursuit for achieving certain universal values. And those universal values for us are defined by the constitution, the values of liberty, equality, fraternity and human dignity. So much as we have differing backgrounds, our different backgrounds must be perceived by us as a source of enrichment because it symbolizes the diversity of India. And the diversity of India as a nation is reflected in the diversity of the profession within the folds of every state. And Andhra Pradesh is no exception. I belong to Maharashtra originally. I was Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court in the largest state, Uttar Pradesh, for a period of close to three years, 27 months. And now, over the last six and a half years, I'm a judge of the Supreme Court of India. But across the board, you find a very deep reflection in the legal profession of the diversity which constitutes, I believe, the greatest strength of our nation. That each of us is in a sense different in terms of the language, in terms of a variety of other factors, including food preferences that I spoke about. But I think it is important for all of us as judges, as young judges, as lawyers, to understand that our differences ought not to divide us, but our differences should be a source through which we recognize that despite these unique personalities which we all are, we are all involved in a common mission which is the pursuit of justice. And this is therefore one of my principal points of appeal to our young judicial officers who are undergoing training today. It is easy for us to say that I am different from someone else. But how superficial is that? Are we truly different from each other? Do we not share the same concerns of a good education, of social stability, of social mobility, for a secure future for our families? If these are common concerns which individuals in the social structure share, then it is not important for us as judges to focus on differences as much as to focus on the unity which binds us as a profession. And that is what I really appeal to you to reflect on this morning. The young judicial officers who will undergo training at the Judicial Academy would be in that sense flag bearers because this is for the first time that you have an organized course of judicial training after the setting up of the High Court. Now judicial training, you must understand, is at one level about imparting judicial knowledge. Through judicial training, you will learn about the intricacies of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the Penal Code, the Code of Civil Procedure, the Transfer of Property Act, the Evidence Act, and a whole host of legislation, both central and state legislation. But imparting knowledge is only one aspect of judicial training. And when I emphasize that imparting knowledge is only one aspect of judicial training, I wish to emphasize this not merely those to those who will be receiving training, 
but equally to those who will be providing training to others. Judicial education is much more than merely imparting information, knowledge or statistics about the nature of the profession. Judicial education is all about imparting values to judicial officers. And those values which we must have, as I said a short while ago, are values which are given to us by the most fundamental document, namely the constitution itself. Very often I have heard the expression that the constitution is expounded in the higher courts, in the high courts, in the supreme court. Nothing would be farther from the truth when we say, or if we were to say, that the district judiciary does not have a vital role in the unfolding of constitutional values. The district judiciary is first and for foremost the point of interface of the common citizen who comes to court with a problem. Therefore, it is important that our judicial officers or our judges in the district judiciary have the right values when they enter the profession. Another very important aspect which we need to emphasize as part of judicial training is something which we have not spoken of in the judiciary, namely a sense of emotional stability. Judges are important stakeholders in the justicing process because we discharge our duties amidst the conflict of parties. Conflicts can get very stressful, whether it be a husband and a wife in conflict, whether it be a labor and employer in conflict, whether it be a landlord and tenant in conflict, or a whole host of, whether it is an accused who is coming face to face for a breach of the penal law. Now in this conflict which unfolds before a court, judges themselves carry a high degree of stress. And it is important for us as judges to absorb those values which would give us a sense of emotional stability in the discharge of your tasks. Now, emotional stability does not begin or end with what you do in a court of law. Emotional stability has its origins in your own mind and body as judges. So if you have to be truly emotionally stable as judges, truly dispassionate, objective, without a sense of bias, it is important for us as judges to focus within, to understand our own limitations as decision makers. Each of us comes with a background. And I just began my presentation this morning by telling you that there are differences of background between different segments of our profession. But it is important for us as judges to understand what lies buried within our hearts, what lies buried within our minds. Because it is when we understand ourselves and we understand the limitations which we own have, each one of us has as an individual, that we can truly become dispassionate decision makers. So understanding your own prejudices, understanding your own biases, unraveling your own prejudices of the mind, unraveling your own prejudices of the heart is the first and basic key to the opening of the justicing process in the personality of a judge. And I do believe, therefore, that our judicial academies must spend a great deal of time in giving a diversified exposure to young judges. While I was the director of the Maharashtra Judicial Academy as a sitting judge of the Bombay High Court, we placed a great deal of importance on exposing young judicial officers to a variety of influences. For instance, we would show a very nice movie, whether it was in Hindi or English or Tamil or Malayalam or Bengali, and we would, after the movie was over, on a social theme, we would request all the young judicial officers to discuss what the movie's theme was. We would take our young judicial officers to a literary festival. We would request our young judicial officers to discuss a good play 
watch a good play. Because to be a judge is not just about coming to a court, deciding an application under Order 39, Rule 1, and either granting or refusing an injunction. Being a judge is all about understanding human life. And unless you understand human life, how can you understand the process of judging? So how do you understand human life? As judges, our lives are restricted. By the very nature of our training, we cannot mix in society. We mix with judges. We tend to have a very restricted field of activity, which is designed to preserve our independence to ensure that we are not open to the kind of unwholesome influences which may sometimes pervade the profession if we were to mix around too freely. But this need to preserve our own independence, our own integrity as judges, by restricting the field of our activity, can sometimes also be a problem because it tends to shut ourselves away from the trends in society. So much as though we keep away from mixing with others, which is perhaps necessary to preserve our own sense of independence and integrity, we must yet be conscious of what is happening around us in society. You must understand the nature of injustice. The higher you go, you will find the more distant you threaten to become. So while we do our work as judges, we must understand that we are deeply connected to and our lives both as judges and as members of the profession are deeply interwoven with the societal fabric. And it is in this mission of understanding society that we can best function as judges. One of the initiatives that we have unveiled today is the digitization of judicial records. Now, this is a very important step to the modernization of the judicial system. By digitizing the records, we can make them more accessible, efficient, and secure. Beyond the benefits of long-term sustainability, the preservation of paper records, which are almost crumbling, the creation of space in record rooms which are flowing beyond capacity in most states. Our efforts in digitization have also shown us an immediate benefit in terms of the issue of pendency of cases. As you all know, at multiple stages, whenever an interim order is appealed from or an application is filed before the appellate courts, be it the High Court or the Supreme Court, the record of the district court is called for. This record then remains with the appellate court till the file is disposed of. In such cases, even if the appellate court does not order a stay, it effectively leads to a stay of proceedings for years at the trial court, even for longer. However, with the digitization of records being available, the record that is received can immediately be scanned and sent back so that the trial does not suffer any delay. I wish to also emphasize another aspect of digitization. Our work on digitization must be accompanied with a strong push towards the e-filing of cases. Now that's one area which I believe that with the intervention of the learned Chief Justice, Andhra Pradesh will be able to make a very positive step forward, which, which is still to begin. It would be counterproductive if we continue producing paper documents, which will again require digitization in the future. Today, we are digitizing the legacy records. But five years down the line, should we be digitizing again the paper which we are consuming between 2023 and 2028? So digitization can have meaning, providing we are e-filing all documents within the judiciary from now on. This would not be possible without the involvement and support of all stakeholders, including not just the judges, 
but rather and primarily the lawyers the lawyers clerks court staff and all others who are involved in the legal profession from the side of the e committee of the supreme court which i chair we have already been reaching out to offer training to all stakeholders including lawyers lawyers clerks and will continue doing it the focus of phase 3 of the e courts project which we are now entering is to build a judicial system which is natively digital while improving the existing physical processes in other words we do not merely intend to digitize paper based processes but we want to transform processes for a digital environment i am also happy to inaugurate the software which will allow for certified copies to be made available online this is an important citizen centric service and reform which increases accessibility to justice by making the process of getting a certified copy hassle free our vision for all our judicial processes must be centered in increasing the accessibility of justice for citizens in pursuance of the transformative ideals of the constitution our mission has to be to ensure that the whole colonial model of people seeking justice is replaced by a new justice delivery system where we reach out to our citizens where the justice system is reaching out to people at the grassroots level now so many of my judges and the colleagues here will say that we are now going to provide certified copies online how many of our citizens have the ability to trace copies online or to receive copies online how many of our citizens have access to the internet in the state of andhra pradesh now therefore providing certified copies on online is just one step in the process our mission in the e courts project is to ensure that all court establishments in every state have e seva kendras attached to them so that the online certified copies may be availed of by our citizens at the e seva kendras as part of the digital india mission common centers common service centers are being set up all over the country down to the level of every gram panchayat now we are trying to ensure that e court services are merged so that the facilities of e courts are available at the level of every gram panchayat and every village in our in our country including the state of andhra pradesh therefore while we take these initiatives in terms of online certified copies in terms of digitizing records the central question at the back of our minds must be what next and how do we ensure that our mission in using greater technology makes us available to the doorsteps of our citizens in other words technology is not an instrument by which the judicial institution will distance itself from citizens technology is merely an instrument to ensure that we reach out to citizens and that is why i have said that this is a means by which we replace the colonial model of administering justice to a more modern vision where we are available to our citizens as we think about increasing access to justice we have to change the image of the judiciary which is based on that classical movie phrase tarikh pe tarikh a starting point can be for all of us in each court establishment be it the high court or the district court to identify the oldest case and the number of cases in the 10 year period after that and target the oldest cases in the next few months i request all of you to instrumental to instrumentalize the information and communications technology tools on the national judicial data grid to monitor the pendency and disposal of cases i was looking at the njdg data for andhra pradesh the oldest civil case in the state is pending in guntur a case that was registered on 22nd march 1980 the oldest criminal case is in anantapur district in the kalyandur court which was registered on 19 september 1978 from 1980 to 1990 in guntur there are four civil cases pending 
and one criminal case. So the district court can move ahead by 10 years just by the disposal of these five cases. Similarly, in Anantapur, there are only 10 cases from 1978 to 1988, nine criminal and one civil. So even Anantapur can move ahead by 10 years just by disposing a paltry number of cases. In the High Court, the oldest case is from 1976 and it just needs to dispose of 138 cases to move 10 years ahead of the curve. So the reason why I am emphasizing this, the data in Andhra Pradesh is not mind-boggling as it is in many other states. But the reason why I mention this is not by way of a critique, but for us to understand that if we use simple tools which are now available on the National Judicial Data Grid, if we just focus on simple tools, you will find that we will be able to do justice and really revolutionize the image of the judiciary in India. At the Chief Justice's conference on Constitution Day this year, we had made a pledge that we will move the judiciary forward 10 years across all court establishments. Our initiative in the form of justice clocks, which will shortly be established in every court establishment, will ensure in monitoring our progress. As I look at more data, considering the smaller number of cases in most court establishments, I am even more hopeful. As we enter 2023, I wonder if we can mark 75 years of independence by turning the justice clocks 10 years ahead, at least in a majority of the cost establishments of our country by Independence Day in 2023. I understand that this task is not easy, as it may seem initially. Many of the cases which remain pending for such a long time are due to the reasons beyond the control of the judiciary. For instance, if you were really to look at the oldest criminal case filed in the criminal system in Andhra Pradesh, it is not the one registered in the courts in Anantapur in 1978, but the oldest criminal case is one which emanates from an FIR filed six years earlier in East Godavari district in 1972. However, it was registered and came before the court almost 35 years later in 2006. This may have been, as we all know, due to a delayed investigation or due to other reasons beyond the control of the court. So the reasons for delay are not always attributable to judges and that is what we need to understand and portray across society. Across the country, according to the NJDG data, Almost 14 lakh cases have been delayed as some kind of record or document is being awaited which is beyond the control of the court. Similarly, across the country, 63 lakh plus cases have been considered to be delayed as per the NJDG data due to the non-availability of counsel. We really need the support of the bar to ensure that our courts are functioning at optimum capacity. I must also note that our current data, which records reasons for delay, is based from inputs from the courts. So it is possible that the number of cases which are delayed due to these reasons is much higher or maybe much lower as we have not received full data from all courts. I also urge all of you to submit the data timely as it allows for the judiciary as an institution to be more transparent with the public on the actual reasons for the delay in the disposal of cases. While speaking in the state which has a history of legendary lawyers pursuing the cause of civil rights, I would be remiss if I did not share a few thoughts on one of the most potent criticisms that has been leveled against the judiciary, its track record in upholding the constitutional principles of liberty. The often cited rule, bail but not jail, is one of the most fundamental rules of the criminal justice system. Yet, in practice, the number of under trials languishing in prisons in India reflects a paradoxical situation. Deprivation of liberty, even for a single day, is a day too many. The judiciary's commitment 
to the constitutional promise of personal liberty has to be bolstered in two significant ways. First, by addressing the quantitative delay in disposing of criminal matters, particularly bail petitions. And second, improving the quality of justice that is dispensed by our courts. What is the value of the rich jurisprudence developed by the Supreme Court and by the High Courts since independence of our nation to preserve and protect the liberty of each individual if that does not come to the aid of the individual at the grassroots level? There is also a brooding sense of fear among courts of the first instance on how the grant of anticipatory bail or bail will be perceived at the higher levels. This fear is not purely irrational. There have been multiple cases where trial court judges have been pulled up for grant of bail. In certain high courts, the performance of judges has been analyzed on the basis of their conviction rate. At the Chief Justice's conference, I have specifically called upon the Chief Justices to ensure that such practices are done away with as they are not a measure of the dispensation of justice in any manner. Rather, these practices create a sense of bias for the district judiciary and create a culture of fear psychosis. This results in either rejection of bail or grant of bail on extremely onerous conditions, both of which are undesirable outcomes. This practice at the district courts sets in motion a vicious cycle where litigants are trapped in a judicial whirlpool, moving to the higher courts continuously and navigating layers of bureaucracy, touts, delay and corruption. Section 438 of the CRPC and Section 439 must not be meaningless mechanical procedural remedies which are pursued at the grassroots level at the district judiciary only to get a rejection and then move a higher court. Remedies must be provided by the district judiciary itself. This affects the poorest of our country, the most, who not only suffer at the hands of the police, but are also caught in this judicial web without adequate economic resources or knowledge to cut through the red tapism of the law. We must realize that the values that have been placed in the care of the judiciary, specifically at the district level, chart the course of a litigant's life for months, if not years to come. Issues of personal liberty must be adjudicated with a fierce sense of urgency. The district courts and the trial courts are the most critical cog in our judicial system. We must get rid of the colonial mindset of referring and treating the district courts as a subordinate judiciary, in hierarchy and in practice. Not only are they the backbone of the judiciary, but they are also the first and for a majority of people, the only interaction with the judicial institution. Chapter 6 of Part 7 of the Indian Constitution is titled Subordinate Courts, but there is no definition of subordinate courts for the purpose of that part. The expression subordinate is used in certain other articles of the Constitution to mean a rank below. Article 235 of the Constitution uses the expression district judges. Article 236, which deals with interpretation of Chapter 6 and Part 7, similarly defines the expression to cover judges across a spectrum in the district judiciary. The administrative control of the High Courts over the district judiciary is to facilitate the separation of powers. It is in order to ensure that the executive does not have control over transfers, appointments, postings and disciplinary control over the district judiciary. The Code of Civil Procedure, the Criminal Procedure Code, use the expression judge, magistrate, Sessions judge, they are not even called judicial officers, they are called judges. Therefore, the subordination which we have ingrained in our minds 
the word subordinate refers to the stages in an appellate process. It is not reflective of a culture of subordination of the district judiciary and should not be reflective of a culture of subordination of the district judiciary. It reflects the administrative control of the high courts over the district judiciary. But I think we have to therefore change our mindsets. And mindsets have to change at the top and mindsets have to change at the bottom as well. It's only when we change our mindsets that we will really be thinking in terms of a modern judiciary for the future. Finally, I want to emphasize the importance of an audit of the infrastructure of the judici district judiciary. It is our failing that even as we enter into 2023, while most high courts have sanitary dispensers for women, most district courts still do not have sanitary dispensers for women. As we celebrate 75 years of independence, many district courts do not even have usable washrooms for women, for women litigants, women lawyers and women judges. We have to treat the creation and maintenance of the infrastructure of the trial courts as an issue of utmost priority. I would like to congratulate the Andhra Pradesh High Court for being one of the first High Courts to have inaugurated and implemented neutral citations. Neutral citations, neutral citations across the country would allow everyone to refer to the court's judgments without gatekeeping by private publishers. It will allow for easier access to judgments. We are also working on neutral citations being implemented at the Supreme Court. I am also happy to inform you that we have built a judgments and orders search portal for common people, students and junior lawyers who have just joined the profession and may not have the resources to get access to private publishers. Before I close, I must acknowledge that adapting to change and especially technology as we grow older, may feel overwhelming. Even I had a very steep learning curve, but this really is the future. And once you cross the learning curve, you realize the benefits would outweigh the slight initial inconvenience. As of today, I don't receive any physical files from the court. My law clerks send me all their research notes digitally. My chamber, is paperless. The judgments which I dictate, the judgments which I dictate come to me in the electronic form and I edit my own judgments on my own on my laptop. Even during the court, I access the files on my own electronic device. All this has been immensely helpful in increasing the efficiency of my own personal work. However, none of the changes in embracing technology be it in our own offices or at the institution level in terms of the e-committee initiatives is possible without a change in the mindset of the bar and the bench. I hope all of you will be leaders in adoption of technology and promoting the e-committee's initiatives. And make no mistake about it, the bar looks up to the judges. Young lawyers look up to judges. Remember the days when we were young lawyers, struggling without briefs, entering a court only to observe what was happening in the court. We would watch the judge very closely and then try to emulate the good judges whom we respected in our own personal lives, in our own professional lives. So when a young lawyer sees a judge looking not at a paper file, but looking at an electronic file, make sure that you are mentoring a whole new generation of individuals in our profession. I once again congratulate every single judge and individual who has been involved in making these initiatives of the Andhra Pradesh High Court possible. I am deeply honored to be here this morning. I thank the Honorable Chief Justice and all his colleagues for according such a wonderful welcome to me yesterday and today. And for all your work as part of our mission to reach out to citizens. Finally, for all your work for our country, I will only conclude 
by saying, and please pardon me if my intonation is not very correct, me, Sevalaku, Nanapurna, Danyavadulu. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord Justice, for the very insightful, encouraging, yet very compassionate and thought-provoking address, my Lord. Now, as a mark of respect, token of your love and immense pleasure, since in Dharma, felicitation to our guest is one with power of gratitude and using articles enriched with Chaitanya, a divine consciousness, as a gift, is a gratitude practice with a spiritual emotion. Today, we are privileged to have an opportunity to felicitate our beloved Honorable Dr. Justice Chandrachud Garu, the Honorable Chief Justice of India. Now, expressing our reverence, may I request Honorable the Chief Justice of India, Sri Chandrachud Garu, to kindly accept our courtesy. May I request Honorable the Chief Justice of Andhra Pradesh, Sri Prashant Kumar Mishraji, Honorable President of AP Judicial Academy, Sri Sri Pravin Kumar Garu, Honorable Members of the Board of Governors, Honorable Sri Justice A.V. Sesh Sai Garu, Honorable Sri Justice U. Durga Prasad Rao Garu, Honorable Sri Justice D.V.S.S. Somya Jalu Garu, and Honorable Sri Justice C. Hash Manvendranath Roy Garu, and the Chairman and Honorable Members of the Information Technology Committee, Honorable Sri Justice R. Raghunandan Rao Garu, Honorable Sri Justice V. Krishna Mohan Rao Garu, and Honorable Sri Justice G. Ram Krishna Prasad Garu to Please come on to the dais to join for felicitation of His Lordship. Thank you, my Lord. <coughs> now may I request Honorable Sri Justice A. V. Sesh Sai Garu to propose out of time. <coughs> By offering Salutations to the architect of our constitution, Sri B. R. Ambedkar, another great son of Maharashtra. I propose vote of thanks today. Today is really a great day in the history of the Andhra Pradesh judiciary. Despite busy schedule, the Honorable Chief Justice of India is very kind enough to grace the occasion. Sir, we are very much indebted to you, sir. The entire judiciary of Andhra Pradesh is offering wholehearted thanks to the Honorable Chief Justice of India. These events have been the much awaited dreams of the state judiciary and they have materialized today. We, the people of Andhra Pradesh, would never forget the great son of the nation, Honorable the Chief Justice of India. Another versatile personality who deserves a big round of applause on this occasion. <laughs> Our friend, philosopher and guide, the Chief Justice of our prestigious High Court of Andhra Pradesh, <laughs> Sri Prasant Kumar Mishraji, and I profusely thank him. Another guiding force for all of us, 
our beloved brother sri justice praveen kumar ji the work he has done for this event is really remarkable and i also thank the board of governors of the academy and all brother and sister judges and computer committee also on behalf of the high court of andhra pradesh and judicial academy i thank the learned advocate general sri sri ram and his team learned public prosecutor sri nagireddy garu and his team learned deputy solicitor general of india sri harinath and his team chairman bar council of ap sri ganta ramarao garu and his team sri janaki ramareddy president of ap high court advocates association and his team presidents of various district bar associations learned judicial officers learned senior advocates educated friends i also thank the director general of police andhra pradesh district collector then superintendent of police guntur district and their teams and the cooperation extended by the university acharya nagarjuna university is really remarkable and i thank the university authorities also finally i express my heartfelt gratitude to all the participants for making this event a grand success thank you very much jai hind may i request the gathering to kindly raise for the national anthem janagana mana adhinayaka jaya he bharat bhagya vidhata punjab sindh gujarat maratha dravid uttar banga हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जगति तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता before concluding the program i request all the honorable judges of ap high court to kindly come on to the dais to have the privilege of taking the photograph with his lordship and thereafter i request all the dignitaries participant officers to kindly have the high tea